So good morning, Springs Church family and our online community. Appreciate it. It's such a beautiful day, and you're in here. You've invested, and we thank you for that. You know, I want to share that at the break, Addie prayed for me, and so I think we're going to have an extra special message today. So thank you. So I'm looking forward to sharing with you about a portion of the Lord's Prayer today. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. So as you know, I like to open up my teaching with the Our Father prayer together. So what an honor to pray that prayer this morning. So we've been talking this month about the Our Father prayer. So I'd like to share with you my heart why the Our Father prayer means so much to me. When my wife and I were first married, we were going and we were taking a class on prayer and we didn't know how to pray out loud. And the pastor said, I have a tip for you. Every night before you go to bed, just say the Our Father prayer out loud together. I'm like, okay. Well, we did that for like five to ten years, and we still do it quite often. So that meant a lot for us. And before Springs of Life, I was a hospice chaplain for several years, and the Our Father prayer was really an impactful prayer to pray with individuals and families. And the Our Father prayer has a way of bringing the Christian denominations together together. It's a common denominator of the faith. And for an example, at a family events or uh, even uh, deathbed situations or gravesite service, the Our Father prayer is perfect. And it's also the Word of God. And in Ephesians 6, we see where it talks about the, the armor of God, the sword of the Spirit. That's the only offensive weapon in the Our Father, in the armor of God, not the Our Father, the armor of God. So when you're saying the Our Father prayer, guess what? You're going to battle, okay? And that is good. So pre, please pray with me, the Our Father prayer with me this morning. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. The lines of kingdom, the power, glory forever. Awesome. Thank you. So I have some special guests here this morning. Tim Ferry Sr. and my mom over here. Annie, they're here. So it's awesome. And also, I call her our adopted daughter from South Korea. She's here, Sonny. And she joined our family in 2011. And it's been an honor to know her. And um, the Teets family. Now, the Teets family is all over here, and they're pretty special. They uh, love God. They honor God. They're hardworking. They're kind. They're welcoming. But the Lord took their family, their mom and dad, home just way too early. But, you know, they could have turned their back on the Lord, but they didn't. And they press in, and they're following through on the Lord's will in their life to share the Lord with honor, integrity, and life in their world. So God. praise God. They're awesome. So I have a special treat for you today. Who understands the term Easter egg when it comes to computer programs or, or games? Right. It's kind of like a hidden gem. All right. It's meant to be discovered. So the clue for today is the Sons of Thunder. Okay, so remember what to do when we get to the Sons of Thunder? Yeah, we make thunder noise with our feet. Awesome. So you'll be ready. So today's scripture comes from Matthew 6.10. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. So Jorge talked last week about the kingdom come, and I really enjoyed what he shared. I talked to several of you this week, and I said, didn't you love what he shared on Sunday? And they said, yeah, we loved it. You know, I told my wife on the way home, I said, you know, that guy is the real deal. I really, I, it really impacted me and enjoyed his, what he had to say. So this piece of the Lord's Prayer is so powerful. You know why? Because we are asking the Lord and giving him permission to use us to bring the kingdom of God from heaven to earth. And it's by allowing us to do his will in our lives, in our world, okay, in our neighborhoods, our work, our families. If we give him permission to do that, then he has some work to do to shape us like clay and to soften our hearts so that we can be used as ambassadors for Christ. 
He uses each one of us just as we are every day, even as we grow in our knowledge and understanding of how this all works. You know, we are all a work in progress, but if we never open our mouths for him because we're trying to be as good as Billy Graham or as good as Joyce Myers or Pastor Chad, we'll never open our mouths, okay? So in Ephesians 2.10, this will give you some confidence here. It says, for we are God's handiwork created in Christ Jesus to do good works which God prepared in advance for us to do. So you see, we have a calling, a destiny. The Lord has a plan for each of us. And we are part of the body of Christ, the Lord's army. You know, I like what Jorge said last week. He said that he prays for opportunities every day to share Jesus with others in everyday life. So let's talk about life, that journey. You know, when you were younger and someone asked you, what do you want to be when you grow up? So think back, what was that? A firefighter, a policeman, a doctor, a veterinarian, an astronaut. You know, as we grow and mature, the Lord uses our dreams and desires, our gifts and talents to lead us to feel drawn to a, a certain field or profession. You know, are you a numbers person? Do you like cooking? Are you a scientific person, a problem solver? Do you like to fix things? Are you a mechanic? Do you have a passion and a heart to serve? Are you a soldier, a coach, a nurse, maybe a counselor or a pastor? You know, one time when I was a teenager, I remembered my brother Randy said to me out of the blue one day, he was like, you know what? You're going to be a pastor one day. I was like, what? And you know what? I thought about that. The Lord brought that to my attention this week. And so I thought I'd share that. And I don't think him and I ever talked about that since. So, um, you know, as we progress through life, we'll see three different wills. The Lord's will, our will, and then others' will on our life. So whose will will win? So what you do for a living and enjoy to do are sometimes two different things. But I always told my kids when they grew up, I said, if you do what you love and what you're good at for a living, you'll never work a day in your life. So that's awesome. You know, life happens, though, and priorities, finances, and simply doing what you have to to pay the bills and put food on the table. You know, I've been there for years. I would say like, hey, Lord, you know, what am I doing here? This is not what I was called to do. I just don't feel like I'm in my groove. So what's your timing? So basically, when we pray, let your will be done, we're not praying, let my will be done. We're saying, Lord, your, your will be done. So in life, sometimes there's obstacles, trials, speed bumps. We're supposed to go through them, not around them, not least path of resistance, not stop and give up, through. You know, about 25 years ago, I was, you know, before that, I went to college and I went, you know, computers and I was in a computer job and the industry just uh, flipped and shifted. I ended up in a factory job working hard. I was, and I was doing computers and factory job. Then I was like studying and figuring out everything. And I was going to the library and I was doing engineering work for the engineering while I was working. Plus I was training and writing SOPs for ISO 9000, whoever remembers that. So I was busy and I loved it, but I still felt like I was out of place. And I prayed for the Lord to move me on. Let's go. And I didn't feel it. He said, just simmer. And I just stayed and I worked hard. And actually, a friend of mine, Bryce Ford, is here today. And I told him, hey, I want, I want to move on. And more than one time in my career, he said, you stay. The Lord's trying to teach you something. I said, okay. So around that time, Linda and I we gave our lives to the Lord. And I sensed a change was coming. And shortly after that, the Lord sent me a word through a friend of mine named Oscar Sanchez. And he said, you need to go back into the field that, you know, you went to college for. You've done a great job here, but it's time. I feel I just need to share that with you. I'm like, oh, awesome. So, um, you know, the, that leads to my first point here, that your will be done, not my will be done. Okay, so that's my first point. You know, in life, we have seasons that we go through. Everything may be going along fine, and then boom, out of nowhere, a sharp right turn. 
And then we feel like it's time for a change. We're called to do something different. You know, for example, my wife and I, we went to River of Life for 24 years. And we loved it. We were working hard. We were ministry leaders. I was doing weddings and funerals, loving people. It was awesome. And, you know, in that church, it's a non-denominational church. So there's no real... um, licensed pastor, you just, if you're in a leader position and you've proved yourself and you're working hard and you've drawn near to the Lord and, you know, you've got integrity and you, you, you know, they, they know, then you can step it up and you can do things. And so I was doing that. But when the Lord pulled us in here to Springs of Life, I went and I met with the pastor and I said, I want to do some weddings and funerals and, and take that off your plate. Maybe even teach some classes. And he said, oh, Tim, slow down. You, it'll take you a while, but, you know, in Springs and Foursquare, we do things a little different. You have to be a licensed pastor. I'm like, okay, well, let's do that. And it took me almost two years to complete, but it has been a great journey. I'm also blessed to have the opportunity to teach from the pulpit, and which is also a dream come true, a huge bonus. And I feel when I'm up here, I'm in the Lord's will. Amen? Amen. All right. All right. I was looking for a little, thank you. So. <laughs> so, so this is an example. When we pray for the Lord's will be done and not our will, what happens? You know, many times down the road of the Lord's will avenue, the path is not always easier. That's why they call it the narrow road, right? We need to trust the Lord and that he knows better than we do. His timing. So, We love this scripture, Proverbs 3, 5, and 6. It says, trust in the Lord with all your heart. Lean not on your own understanding. And in all your ways, submit to him, and he'll make your paths straight. Yes. So my point number two, keep your radar up for life-changing nudges from the Lord. Okay? So same with Jesus. The night before Jesus was crucified, he was in the Garden of Gethsemane, And he knew what he was going into. He knew it was going to be a tough road. And Jesus prayed to God, his father, three times that his will be done. All right? Now, maybe Jesus was thinking, hey, I think I've accrued some vacation time here. How about, you know, like a short term of absence or something? I'm going to take a break. So let's read that and see what happens. So we're going to read from Matthew 6. I'm sorry, Matthew 26, 37 to 44. And he took Peter and the two sons of Zebedee, the sons of thunder, all right, nice work, with him and began to be grieved and distressed. Then he said to them, my soul is deeply grieved to the point of death. Remain here and keep watch with me. And he went a little beyond them and fell on his face and prayed, saying, my father, if it is possible, let this cup pass from me. Yet not as I will, but as you will. And he came back to the disciples and found them sleeping. And he said to Peter, so you men could not keep watch with me for one hour? Keep watching and praying so that you do not come into temptation. The spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. He went away again a second time and prayed, saying, my father, if this cup cannot pass away unless I drink from it, your will be done. Again, he came and found them sleeping for their eyes were heavy. And he left them again and went away and prayed a third time, saying the same thing once more. So three times Jesus came back, found his disciples sleeping. I wonder if the enemy caused them to sleep and let Jesus down when he needed his friends the most. You know, I believe God wanted to help his son, but the plan was for Jesus to be beaten and crucified, and there was no turning back. So But I want to point something out here. Check out what God does to encourage and strengthen Jesus through this in Luke 22, okay? As he goes through, all right? So let's read Luke 22, 42 through 44. Father, if you are willing, take this cup from me. Yet not my will, but yours be done. An angel from heaven appeared to him and strengthened him. And being in anguish, he prayed more earnestly And his sweat was like drops of blood falling to the ground. So I want to go back a bit and talk about Moses and the Amalekites, this war that they had. So Aaron and Hur, they held up Moses' arms during this battle. 
And if he held up his arms, they were winning. That's right. But if he took his arms down, he wasn't winning. So Moses was holding up that staff, right? And Aaron and her buddies, compadres, friends, amigos, they were helping him out. But Jesus' disciples could have been that support for him during that time, but they weren't there. They didn't. They let him down. So, you know, even when your friends and family let you down, the Lord will be there for you. He sent an angel to Jesus. He will never leave you nor forsake you. You know, Jesus went through it, right? Jesus was saying, I don't want to do this, but not my will be done. Your will be done is what he prayed. So notice Judas, Jesus said, okay, I'm going forward. I'm going to do it. But, you know, he said, Lord, your will. And then God sent that angel to strengthen him. So we need to say, yes, that we're going to go through. Amen. Okay. And what may seem impossible, the Lord will strengthen and encourage you. Right. So Jesus was in anguish and agony and he sweat drops of blood. That is intense. Did God's will turn out? Was it worth it? Let's see. I'm going to share something with you you may not have heard before. When he, when, you know, when we accept the Lord into our hearts, we choose Jesus as our Savior, which, by the way, is the will of God. He says in the Bible that his will is that we be reconciled to God. And we do this by asking the Lord into our heart, trusting him as our Lord and Savior. And when this happens, you will be saved or born again when we acknowledge Jesus as our Savior. And here's what will happen. Number one, G, uh, angels in heaven are, will rejoice. And there's a lot of angels in heaven, right? Your name is written in the Lamb's book of life in heaven. Number three, the Holy Spirit will be birthed in you. It'll be your spiritual birthday. That's why they call it being born again. And when you die, you'll be at the gates of heaven and you'll have a fast pass, like if you're at Disney. They'll check the Lamb's Book of Life. They'll see the line. They'll go, okay, number 752. Come, come on up here. You're in the book. Right on in. You're in here. And if you, you know, you will live in eternity in heaven. And that is why it's referred to as being saved, because you'll be saved from eternal death. All right? And a bonus feature is here, while you're on earth, you have VIP access to Jesus. Okay? And have a personal relationship with Jesus. And this is done through the Holy Spirit, which is our conduit to heaven. A bi-directional circuit. Not half duplex, full duplex. Okay? That's for your techies out there. So, So here's a little gray cloud here. You will not be exempt from trials or problems. But through these problems, you will grow in your spiritual maturity Grow in the fruit of the Spirit, grow in your gifts and talents, and be able to love big and be unoffendable and love people in your world. You know, it sounds like a lot, but it's one day at a time. And know this, the Lord loves you right where you are at. And nothing you do or don't do can make him love you any more or any less. Okay? So I learned this from a a pastor a long time ago, Zach Blickens, a legend. And he said, this is as simple as A, B, C. So I want to share that with you. A is accepting Jesus, okay? I'm sorry. Igne is acknowledging that you're a sinner. I'm sorry. We'll get this right. We need Zach up here, okay? And that you're not perfect and that you need to be saved from your sins. So Jesus' perfect life and sacrifice on the cross paid the price for your sins. We love John 3, 16. It says, For God so loved the world that he gave his only son that whosoever should believe in him shall not perish but have everlasting life. And B stands for believe in Jesus. In Acts 16, 31, that's the story of the jailer. I love this story because it says, in the middle of the night, he was baptized, him and his whole family. What if you're like a teenager? I love bringing this up. And your your dad wakes you up. Get up, we're gonna be baptized. And they're like, Now I'm awake, right? It's like, man, that water's cold. So it says, believe in the Lord Jesus and you will be saved, you and your household. See, confess. Confess with your mouth that you believe that God raised Jesus from the dead and you will be saved. So I'm going to pray a real simple prayer here right after this. You can repeat after me. You can say it quietly. You can make up your own words. It's so simple. 
That's why they call it the, the good news. So, Lord, I acknowledge that I'm not perfect. I can't get to heaven by my good deeds or my money or how good a person I am. I believe that you lived a perfect life and you sacrificed on, your, on the cross your life for mine so that my sins could be forgiven. I ask you into my heart, Lord, and ask you to be the savior of my life. Thank you, Lord. Amen. Amen. So congratulations if you prayed that prayer. You're saved. You're born again. Welcome to the family, the Lord's army. So if you did pray that prayer, I want you to share that with somebody before you leave so we can stand with you in your faith journey. It's huge. The first day of the rest of your life. You hear me? So I'm going to really stress that the Lord's will will be done. If you fight it, you know those nudges? You'll feel just not right in your gut, in your heart. You'll just be uneasy, not able to feel like you can follow through on your current dreams and purposes. You know, the reason I want to make this important point is, if you're going to pray, Lord, let your will be done and not my be, will be done, then you need to let the Lord be in control of the steering wheel of your life. So how does this work? Well, we've talked about this before, this Psalm 37.4. He puts dreams and desires into your heart and then you pursue life and you, you feel those and you do them. You're doing God's will. So let's read that a second here. Psalm 37, 4. Take delight in the Lord and he will give you the desires of your heart. You know, for years, I always thought, yeah, I'm gonna, I want to do this. And I would think really hard. I'm like, Lord, let's do this. And then I would end up doing something else. I'm like, you know, a, a different dream, a different desire. And I'm like, okay, Lord, how, okay, I'm do that for you. I feel that desire. But what about this? And it was like one day I read a commentary on it and I watched a video and I just remember reading and I'm like, wow, that guy said that the Lord is putting those dreams in my heart and then I'm doing them. So I'm like, I wanted to share that with you. That's really good. So when you're in a transition season, Change can be difficult. Life can be uncomfortable. Oh, yeah. I want to share a couple of those examples with you. And looking back on these two examples, I can see the Lord was preparing me for this. And my role is pastoral care to love this family. You know, in 2015, I met a man at First Church that Open Bible. And I went to a men's group there, and it was really awesome. And he was talking, and I really was intrigued by what he was saying. But then he said he was a hospice chaplain. And my all the hair stood up on my arms, and I almost started to, you know, look at me. It's crazy. And um, the Lord said, go talk to him after class. I said, okay. So I said, tell me about this hospice chaplain thing. He goes, why do you ask? I go, I told him. He goes, we got to talk. So we went out to lunch, and he gave his blessing for me to, to be on the team. He was my field supervisor. I was just volunteering, volunteering, but I loved it. My first assignment was in Owine, Iowa. And I, and I went up there, and I was a gal that had been in a coma for two months. And the nurse said, are you sure you want to talk with her? She's been in a coma for two months. And I go, no, I don't care. I said, the Lord's got me here, and, and the, the hearing's the last to go. I want to meet with her. And you know, the, it, as I talked with her and I prayed with her, the Lord prompted me exactly what to say, exactly what to pray, I led her to forgive people. Thank you, Jesus. I led her to the Lord. I led her to forgive herself. And then I said, it's okay. Go and be with the Lord. You're done. You've lived your life. And she had a tear that came out of her eye, and I didn't know if it was just a medical thing or she was really touched. I'm like, praise God. Guess what? I got a phone call the next day that she passed away. And I was like, amen, amen. So for the next four years, I enjoyed loving several people. And my patients, I called them, even though I'm not a doctor, <laughs> as a volunteer hospice chaplain into heaven. You know, when COVID hit and it was time for me to got, start pursuing my four square license, the Lord said, you're done. You know, I was kind of doing my hospice chaplain from little cards and pictures and from, you know, a window and, and I was okay with that, but the Lord just said, you're done. Well, about the same time, for 20 years, I've been racing bicycles. Twice a week in the summer, once a month in the winter, I'd go to some indoor track in the Midwest. And 
I, you know, in the winter of 2019, I felt like the Lord said, you're done, we're not racing next year. And I thought maybe that was just me with self-pity and, and how everybody was all anxious with COVID and everything. I'm like, you know, maybe they won't have a season and I'm just not gonna train. I didn't know what it was, but I just felt like there's a change coming. Well, about mid-season, not even mid-season because we started late from the rain that year, and the Lord, I was in a practice lap for a race, and all of a sudden, I was just like, what am I doing here? Like, I woke up, and I was just like, I don't even want to be here. I want to go see my wife. I want to ride my backyard track. I have a track in my backyard. And it was all I could do was finish the main event and get in my car and go home. It was like I had the trunk up, and I just threw my bike in and went home. And I haven't raced since. I've raced, but I haven't raced competitively for that. Only one race. So. But the Lord, he wanted me to focus my heart and my attention here. And, and my, my, my job to love and serve springs of life through pastoral care. He changed my heart. So here again, when we pray, Lord, let your will be done, not my will be done. This is what happens. Okay? I want to share a scripture with you. It's Matthew 6, 21. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. In Proverbs 4.23, above all else, guard your heart for everything you do flows from it. So my third point is here, what are your treasures? What are you thinking about? So think back, what has the Lord been doing in your life? What were some of the transitions he's led you through as you hindsight your life and look back? Or maybe the Lord is working on a transition stage right now in your life. You know, I want to share you an example of a famous person, John the Baptist. You know, he was a big deal. People came to see him out in the desert to be baptized and listen to his message about repentance and about being baptized and telling people about the coming of the Messiah. You know, in Luke 7, starting in, chapter, in verse 18... It says, John the Baptist sent his disciples to ask Jesus if he was the Christ, the Messiah. And Jesus said this. Jesus explained that the deaf hear, the blind see, the lepers are cleansed, and the dead are raised. And John the Baptist knew that his ministry was winding down. The attention was to be on Jesus. And in John chapter 3, verse 30, John the Baptist said, I must decrease so that he can increase. And then John the Baptist went from five foot 11 to five foot three. All right, got that? All right, ba-dum-bum, -bum. all right. For those who missed that chapter in the Bible, John was beheaded by King Herod in Matthew 14. Kind of sad. So the Lord's will will be done. It's just a matter of how comfortable, uncomfortable you will be as you fight his will. So the bottom layer will... I'm sorry, the bottom line is here, when we pray your will be done, the Lord's will and not our will, we acknowledge God's right to steer our ship and our journey in life. So my fourth point is, it's difficult to go against the Lord's will. And what's great about the Lord's will is when his will is being done in our lives, we are representing him. We are ambassadors for Christ on this earth as it is in heaven, it says in the Our Father prayer. And again, I'm not much for uh, repeating scripture, but I love this one. It fits right in here. I said this one earlier. It's Ephesians 2.10, okay? For we are God's handiwork created in Christ Jesus to do good work, which God prepared in advance for us to do. Amazing. We're ambassadors for Christ. We are bringing heaven to earth when we are walking, talking, and loving in the Lord's will. So how does this happen? You know, we're selfish by nature, but as we lean into the Lord and apply what the Bible says and what we're learning each week, we're becoming Christ-like. So how do we know that we're becoming Christ-like? I got some examples written down here. Maybe we take a second glance at someone who's going through hardships and we think, how can I help? You see someone down and you encourage them. When someone offends you by what they do or what they say to you, you forgive them unconditionally. When you're in a group, you listen and you draw out conversations from people instead of doing all the talking. You never return evil for evil, but with a blessing instead. That's a tough one. You have a servant's heart 
have the attitude that you're in the mode to serve and not to be served. So this is your life's attitude, your barometer. You ever notice that when it rains, they say that the barometer is the thing that changes the most and that measures the air change pressure in the atmosphere. Well, the attitude of our heart is our barometer. When you have pressures on you, how does your heart respond? How do you respond to the changes in life's pressures? You know, when you're going through life, not around it, not least path of resistance, but through, it can be painful at times. But the Lord sends us the comfort we need to strengthen us just like he did Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane. And then we are told to use that same comfort to do what? Comfort others. Wow. You know where I'm going, right? 2 Corinthians 1, 3 through 5. Check this out. Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of compassion and the God of all comfort, who comforts us in all our troubles so that we can comfort those in any trouble with the comfort that we ourselves receive from God. For just as we share abundantly in the sufferings of Christ, so also our comfort abounds through Christ. That's obedience, right? I love that. Pay it forward. You ever heard that saying? I love that. Someone helps you, so you help someone, and then they want to pay you or give you something in return. You say, nah, pay it forward to someone in need. I love this. Get comfort, give comfort. We do this through the Holy Spirit. You know, we serve others with the love from the Lord, using our gifts, our talents. We can't waste a single day. I like this scripture here, this Ephesians 5, 15 through 17. It says that we are supposed to make the, the, the most of every day, every opportunity, and to understand what the Lord's will is. Let's read that. In Ephesians 5, 15 through 17, it says, be careful. Well, it says, be very careful. Then how you live, not as unwise, but as wise, making the most of every opportunity because the days are evil. Therefore, do not be foolish, but understand what the will, what the Lord's will is. This verse is kind of a cliffhanger, isn't it? So what is the Lord's will? Well, the next verse tells us what his will is. Romans 5, 18, it says, do not get drunk on wine, which leads to debauchery. Instead, be filled with the Spirit. So to be filled with the Spirit, how do we do this? We receive. We need less face book and more face time with the Lord, right? You like that? I like that. Time with the Lord to be encouraged and to hear what His will is for your life, to fill us up with His presence, the Holy Spirit. So many times in the Bible, the stories of Paul and Acts and the other uh, epistles, it says, you know, that the believers received the Holy Spirit. And you're like, okay, done, check. But then in another verse and down another chapter, another city, it says, and they were filled with the Holy Spirit. And it's like, awesome. It's not a one-time thing. You know, when, if you're feeling like something that this is, you know, you're feeling like, I need to have that. I need to have a fill up. And when we invite the prayer teams down, come down and pray and the prayer teams will pray for you, okay? At the gas pumps, you're going to pay four fifty dollars a gallon for gas. But the Holy Spirit, guess what? Free, yep. all right? Amen. So my fifth point is this. Spend time with the Lord and, he, and find his will for you, for your life. So life is tough sometimes, isn't it? Yep. My June was one of the toughest months I had in a long time. Writing this message at times with frustrations, no sleep. I injured my back on a bike ride. A massive work project was 100 hours in one week. I was up at 5 and to bed around 11 o'clock every night. And my brother was knocking on death's door. He was uh, flown to Mayo two times, airlifted. He had several stent surgeries for his heart. And, you know, having priorities out of my control... It needed to be taken care of. You know, Linda and I, we went through it. But while we went through it, we gave thanks for the good that was in the midst of what we couldn't control. And we also appreciated all your prayers during that time. You know, we were staying at my dad's, taking care of my dad while my mom was with my brother. And uh, it was awesome. It was an honor 
to serve my dad during that time. You know, I want to share a promise with you in the Bible that should motivate us in the area of the Lord's will is in the area of serving and loving our family. Isaiah 58, 7 and 9. It says, Is it not to share your food with the hungry and to provide the poor wanderer with shelter? When you see the naked, to clothe them and not to turn away from your own flesh and blood. Then your light will break forth like the dawn and your healing will quickly appear. Then your righteousness will go before you and the glory of the Lord will be your rear guard. Then you will call and the Lord will answer. You will cry for help and he will say, here am I. What a great promise, right? See, in the Bible, one of the Ten Commandments was to honor your mother and your father. And this passage shares that we are not to turn our back on others, especially our own flesh and blood. When we do serve them in their time of need, the Lord sees this as an offering on your part to love and to serve. And my wife and I notice that he gives us the love and the grace and the strength needed to serve when needed. It wasn't a chore. It wasn't a burden. It was an honor. Okay? So when you're going through it, lean on the Lord and ask him for tough, when the tough times, you ask him for strength and peace and he'll give it to you. So church family, body of Christ, I'm not perfect. I don't know if it's possible to stay in the Lord's will 24-7, but the Lord is perfect and he knows what you're going to pray before you pray. But guess what? He's watching our hearts and he wants us to come to him and remember that we are family. And if you need help, you need to reach out. We don't want you to hit bottom. Okay, you are loved. So let me close with this awesome verse about the Lord's will for our lives. It's Mark 12, 28 to 31. It says, one of the teachers of the law came and heard them debating, noticing that Jesus had given them a good answer. He asked them, of all the commandments, which is the most important? The most important one answered Jesus is this. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our, your God is one. Love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind and with all your strength. The second is this. Love your neighbor as yourself. There is no greater commandment greater than these. Each time I read this, I always think, Jesus is telling us to keep it simple. Love God, love others, love yourself. You know, with the bad news all around us, chaos, it's uncertainty in our economy, but be a beacon be that ambassador for Christ. Be that light to your family, in your neighborhood, and at work. We need to love big, love God, love your neighbor, and love yourself. We need to keep the faith, fight the fight, and run our race. Amen. So let me just do a little closing in prayer. Lord, you know what your will is for our lives. And Lord, we pray that my family, my church family, take time to lean into you and find out what the, your will is for their life and that they would be sensitive to change in, in that what you have planned for them. And as we hear and feel those nudges from you and your word and from what you're touching on their hearts, I pray that they would lean into your will and lean into those changes. And uh, Lord, I just pray this Psalm, I just read this yesterday, Psalm 143.10, it says, teach me to do your will for you are my God. May your good spirit lead me on level ground. So please extend your hand for the pastoral blessing. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. May the Lord's face turn towards you and give you peace. Amen.